Greetings all! It is Paddy's Day, so a quick little bit of Irish OPD. That's Officer Professional Development, for those who don't know. Uh, to give you a little bit of a food for thought. I had mentioned a while ago I'd go into a balls up by the British Army and how they kind of squandered an opportunity to help stop the troubles of Northern Ireland before they got going, and I figured this is as good a time as any. Operation Banner was one of the longest operations undertaken by the British Army, and it occurred on home ground. Now, of course, this is Northern Ireland. Uh, it's obviously a massive subject with plenty to talk about, and I'm certainly not going to cover it in a 15-minute video. I just want to make note of how a decision made by an officer operating in an aid to the civil power role, uh, that's defense support to civil authorities for Americans, which was absolutely tactically correct, led to the seizure of weapons, ammunition, and explosives, and incidentally also devolved the situation into three decades of insurgency and terrorism. Now, as I say, the background is ridiculously complex, and even I'm not feeling confident enough to tackle it. But at the most basic level, when Ireland was split into two jurisdictions, it was after several hundred years of being under control from London. There were several rebellions, uprisings, a war of independence, and then a civil war over whether or not it was acceptable to see the North remain within the UK. However, let's not bicker and argue about who killed who. Uh, suffice to say that by the 1960s, the situation in the North was you know, tense, but generally quiet. The catch was that the local parliament, Stormont, was dominated by Protestants. The place was gerrymandered to hell, and though the laws were officially neutral to all parties, the way that they were implemented were such that there was severe social and economic discrimination against the Catholic community. Now, again, to be clear, this isn't really a religiously motivated divide. It's not like a religious conflict, but it is a very convenient catch-all for the populations of the two sides. Not all Catholics were nationalists or Republicans, for example. As bad as the political situation was, the policing situation was as bad. The local police force, the Royal Ulster Constabulary, and particularly their auxiliary units, the B Specials, were not considered impartial by the population. The 1960s was a period of the civil rights movement in the US, and it seems to have been successful. This led to the Northern Ireland Civil Rights Association being created. The movement grew, and marches started being held. Suffice to say that the response by the RUC and Protestant factions was not a particularly model one, appalling even the British government in London, and things escalated badly, culminating in the Battle of the Bogside, a three-day event which eventually saw the police admit that they had completely lost control, and so the initial request was sent for the deployment of army forces. Although the sight of British troops may have galled some of the more nationalist members of the Catholic community, they were generally accepted as a neutral power trying to do their best. Certainly not as biased as the police. A British investigation in 1969 reported that the RUC were incompetently led with poor morale and little political oversight. Also, the army supposedly took their orders from London, not Stormont. Indeed, in Belfast, the IRA, not the provisional, this predates it, originally assisted the British Army in protecting Catholic areas, and the first people to actively shoot and kill British security forces were Loyalists, who were extremely displeased with the result of the Hunt Report, which had recommended reforming and disarming the RUC to be a more British-type force, and also the disbanding of the B Specials. The British did shoot back. Uh, but in a rather restrained manner, only two to six Loyalists were killed in the Shank Hill Gun Battle of October 1969. However, the authorities were still relatively ineffective at restraining more aggressive forces on the Unionist side, to include, frankly, from the police, and the Catholics started to undertake a self-defense policy. If the authorities couldn't or wouldn't do the job, they would use whatever methods they had to protect themselves. Thus, arms, petrol bombs, whatever, started being collected and, if necessary, used against hostile incursion into free areas, complete with barricades. The Provisional IRA was created in December 1969 to defend the Catholics who were not being successfully defended by anybody else. This relationship of welcoming the British Army, however, changed soon enough. Initially, the British Army was deployed, quote, to take all necessary steps acting impartially between citizen and citizen to restore law and order." Unquote. Here's the problem, though. 
the army had a fairly successful history of counterinsurgency operations and this was really a deployment to aid the civil authority policing in effect the civil authority in northern ireland was stormont and the police that they were aiding was the RUC. Thus, even though the army were not necessarily prone to the biased successes of the RUC, they still took exception to these supposed no-go areas and the idea of people using arms and petrol bombs to prevent the lawful authorities going around their business. There are plenty of other issues as well, such as a complete lack of understanding in Great Britain as to the cultural issues of Ireland, you know, thinking that Irish people were just Britons like everybody else. But the bottom line was that the army had a job to do, they were going to do it. The people making trouble against the government were the nationalists. Political concerns were not the army's problem. They were to restore order. Further, after four months, the original troops which had created the positive relationship with the Catholic communities were rotated out and replaced by new troops who had obviously no such relationship established. The Royal Scots were one of these units, and when they showed up to a fracas in Ballymurphy in March 1970, they saw Catholics attacking Protestants. It was actually a, sort of a retaliation for earlier events, but they lined up against the Catholics because A, that's who they saw out of their normal area, and B, well, they themselves were also predominantly Protestant, and Scots kind of care about the religion a bit more than most. I think it's like a, a Celtic Rangers thing there as well, but whatever. In what may seem to be a bizarre state of affairs today, the three days of riots fueled by liberal use of CS gas by the army only died down after the Scots were replaced by an English unit. As reported in the Times, an attack was halted by one of the nationalists crying out, don't throw at them, they're English, not Scots. This was not helping the army's case, but what really sealed the deal was the Falls Road incident in July 1970. Some call it the Falls Curfew, some the Battle of the Falls, or maybe the Rape of the Falls. It was what is known as marching season, when certain organisations tend to go on commemorative marches, usually celebrating Protestant events like Reformation Day or the Battle of the Boyne. Those of you in Canada may also be familiar with it, the Orange Parade in Toronto is still an annual event every July. They are viewed by others, particularly nationalists and Catholics, as deliberately provocative. Long story, particularly where roots are concerned and not something I'm going to go into here. Regardless, suffice to say, tensions were already high. One march went through an area called Short Falls. It's a little Catholic enclave with St. Matthew's Church in the middle. The locals and marchers went from shouting at each other to shoving to stone throwing and then finally to shooting. Anybody in the area with a gun or a petrol bomb showed up, and the church was the primary target of petrol bombing, and it also turned into the primary defensive position of the Catholics with guns, in this case the Provisional IRA. The ensuing five-hour battle saw three killed, 26 wounded. Security forces were stretched thin elsewhere, and the few soldiers in the area were somewhat disinclined to interpose themselves between two sides in the middle of a firefight, obviously gone past the good offices of peacekeepers. The result of the battle was that the Loyalists were repelled, and though a pub and the sexton's house were destroyed, the church and a majority of residence houses were not. This success drove home to the Catholic community that until the larger situation changed, they had to have weapons and munitions to defend themselves, as they could not rely on anybody else to do it. The Provisional IRA then started bringing such materiel into other Catholic areas for the purpose. The next week, the army, in its goal of maintaining the rule of law, moved in to remove those weapons. 3rd of July, 4 p.m., the Royal Scots assist the RUC in the search of a house based off of a tip that weapons and explosives would be found there. The house was located on Balkan Street in the Falls area. Twelve pistols, a carbine, ammunition and explosives were found, but as they attempted to leave at 5.30 p.m., the soldiers and police found that they were being opposed by protesters throwing stones at them. They responded with CS gas, which brought out more protesters, so they holed up and called in reinforcements. Reinforcements showed up, deployed more CS gas, thus gaining the ire of even more of the population, themselves getting to the point that even more reinforcements were needed to get them out, and in the process an armoured personnel carrier struck and killed a protester. Eventually, live ammunition started being fired by both sides at about 8pm. 
Army say the nationalists fired first, but whatever, things were escalating. Over the next two days, the British Army would fire 1,450 rounds of ball, 218 CS grenades, and 1,350 CS cartridges. By 9 p.m., the on-scene brigade commander, possibly taking fire in his helicopter, ordered the troops out and the area to be surrounded. The residents started building barricades. By 10 p.m., the general officer commanding, General Freeland, ordered a curfew. 3,000 troops were involved in enforcing it. They implemented a cordon and search of all houses in search of arms and ammunition. Insofar as that went, it was successful. 107 firearms, including a half dozen machine guns, 21,000 rounds of ammunition, 25 pounds of explosives were all found. Now, if I had come out of a cordon and search in Iraq with that haul, I'm pretty sure I'd been given congratulations. To do it, however, they basically went, as I say, into each and every house to search. The level of destruction and disrespect to the residents is argued, but one can imagine that firearms and ammunition were not normally kept on open display, and everyone in about a thousand houses went through it, innocent, neutral or not. Few houses had their floorboards left intact. The curfew was lifted for two hours on a second for folks to gather some groceries from local stores, but nobody was allowed in or out of the area. So, to recap. Thus far, the British Army have taken away what was perceived to have been the local citizenry's only effective defence, and humiliated and insulted an entire community in doing so. The containment and curfew stayed in place until the afternoon of 5th of July, when a march of some 3,000 women with children, armed with groceries, refused orders to stop and just march through the perimeter lines with supplies. I mean, obviously the army aren't about to use force in such a body of people, so they lost face there as well. From that point on, the British Army were considered without question to be a hostile force, and it basically led to almost 30 years of domestic combat operations. So, there is a bit of food for thought for you. How a lack of awareness... Really? I only just charge these batteries. I'm just going to finish it. <laughs> How a lack of awareness of even domestic issues could result in tactical success but strategic disaster in a military operation. When dealing with foreign issues, things get you know, even more interesting. There is, as I've said, far, far more to the story of Operation Banner than the above. I mean, it was 30 odd years. I barely touched on the first year. The British Army did do a pretty fair assessment of what it did right and wrong over those three decades, and I've a link to it in the comments below. It's only 100 pages long and it's you know, written in plain English, rather unusually for an army document, and I submit it probably should be required reading for anyone with an interest in military civil operations or about to deploy on the streets interacting with civilians. All right, that's it. A short one. I'll talk to you on the next one and I'm going to see what's wrong with my floodlight batteries because the things are barely on for 12 minutes. Take care. <laughs>